the Renaissance sonnet took on its own qualities in French as it uh, got into the hands of the uh, one of the great geniuses of French literature, Joachim du Bellay. Uh, he, as a great advocate of the use of French as a vernacular, uh, particularly in love poetry, he, uh, he did a, uh, a remarkable job of bringing in the intonations of, uh, of that language into the particular uh, form and structure of the sonnet as a, uh, as a medium for expressing uh, great emotion and the uh, well the philosophical underpinnings of the Renaissance itself you can see it most uh, clearly perhaps in his sequence the antiquities of Rome something he wrote after having toured the city himself and the uh, the, the peculiar qualities of the of the language really come out now uh, the uh, the selection that we have here um, is again very uh, very trim in comparison to the total but you get a, a real sense of where he was going. And in particular, uh, if you look at the original French, uh, you can really hear the, uh, the oh, well, you could see and imagine the, uh, the, the qualities of French as it, uh, as it plays out within this very structured, rigid form of the sonnet. Now, you got to forgive me as I go through uh, a, a, a little French here, and it's going to be ugly, but please bear with me. Uh, number three, or trois. Nouveau veni qui cherchait Rome et Rome, et rien et Rome et Rome ne perçoit. C'est vu palais, c'est vu arc, que tu vois, et c'est vu, et vu meurs, c'est ce que Rome et Rome. Voy quel orgueil, quel ruin, et comme celle qui mise le monde sous les lois, pour dompter tout, Sedanta quelque fois, et devin proye à ton qui, qui tout consomme. Rome de Rome, et c'est sur le monument, et Rome, Rome a vaincu seulement. Le tibre saut qui vers la mer l'enfui, reste de Rome, au mandin en constance, que ce qui, ce qui est ferme, ce qui est ferme et par les temps destruit, et ce qui fuit est ton fait résistance. Now, uh, without knowing French, you can see a very, uh, a, a very fixed uh, AB, uh, ABBA, ABBA um, structure to the, uh, to the octet in this sonnet, and then a CCD, ECE, sestet. Interesting little spin. <clears throat> Um, the, uh, the, the rhyme itself is, uh, uh, is, is very fluid, as the French language tends to be, even when butchered by somebody like me. But probably the most prominent part in this is the use of the word haram, with that, uh, that great breathy O sound in it, haram. Um, there is a, uh, a spectral quality to it, and the repetition of Rome, the way it keeps bringing back that sound throughout, repeating conspicuously one after the other so that it starts to sound a little strange and it takes on a kind of otherworldly quality within the poem itself. And this, uh, this, uh, this diaphanous quality almost is at some odds with the very uh, rigid structure of the poem. Again, the, my pronunciation is going to butcher it, but the, uh, but the rhythm, the meter is very regular, the rhyme is very fixed, and yet you get this free-floating sound within it that is a spirit living within the structure. And that is the that is the essence of this entire sequence, and especially, I would say, this first poem, which in English reads, um, according to the Richard Helgerson uh, translation, Newcomer, you who seek Rome in Rome and find nothing of Rome in Rome, 
these old palaces, these old arches that you see, and these old walls, this is what they call Rome. See what pride, what ruin, and how she who brought the world under her laws in vanquishing all, at last vanquished herself and became the prey of time which devours all. Rome is the only monument to Rome, the only Rome conquered Rome. Only the Tiber, which flees toward the sea, remains of Rome. O oh, worldly inconstancy, whatever stands firm is destroyed by time, and whatever flees resists time. He is walking through Rome and imagining giving a, uh, a, a, a bit of a, uh, an introduction, if you will, to his uh, fellow travelers. <laughs> And he's saying, okay, you know, yeah, you see a lot of stuff falling around, but it's, it's not just the, uh, the, uh, it, it's just not, it's not just wreckage. It is the spirit behind it. It's the ability to see a, uh, a history, a, uh, a wonder, a majesty within the empire as a ruin. We are left with it in the modern day, uh, let's say of the Renaissance as uh as, as just rubble lying around but we can use it as a transport we can use it as a worldly hint of the greatness of rome in the past the greatness of the empire the greatness of the republic the greatness of Virgil and Ovid and 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 Horace and and Catullus and all of these guys that spirit of greatness that so fascinated the uh, the, the Renaissance mind um and 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 that sense of the uh the the wonder within the outward appearance. The outward appearance, eh, you just see a lot of rubble lying around. Um, but if you just look at it and try and weed out the uh, the appearances and the distractions and the refractions of time, you can see something very special within it. Whoever wishes to see all that nature, art, and heaven have been able to do, let him come to you, Rome, if, that is, he can imagine your greatness from what is only your lifeless portrait. Rome is no more, and if her ruins still show us some, some shade of Rome, it is like a body raised by magic powers from its sepulcher at night. The body of Rome has returned to ashes, and her soul has gone to rejoin the great soul of the material universe. But her writings, which in spite of time rest her fairest praise from the grave, keep her specter wandering through the world. Her writings, the writings of the greats, the writings of the poets, the writings of Cicero even, the, the writings of antiquity itself that are being rediscovered, that are being unearthed, that are being suddenly reappreciated in the, in the Renaissance era. That is the legacy. And that worldly legacy is somehow more, um, more valued. The, uh, the history is fascinating to them, but it's the writing, something that they can still use. It's not just about the um, uh, the the wonder of it and the far away. Oh, gee, wasn't that a great time? Aspect of the uh, the classical age. It is the use of it. We can use their writings for ourselves. We can make use of it. It has a worldly and humanistic good attached to it. 
Neither the fury of raging flame, nor the sharp edge of a victorious steel, nor the destruction of a furious soldier, which have so often pillaged you, Rome, nor vicissitudes of your changing fortune, nor the destruction of envious time, nor the spite of men and gods, nor your own power turned against yourself, nor the shocks of impetuous winds, nor the overflowering of that twisted god who has so flooded you with his waters, have so lowered your pride that the greatness of the nothing they have left that have left you does not still amaze the world the passion the rolling passion that comes up in this the wonder of it all from these again he's, he's looking around at the ruins the antiquities the little relics that they have of a time so long ago uh, that he is somehow breathing in the fumes of a more majestic age. Pale spirits and you ashen shades, who, while you enjoyed the light of day, brought forth this proud city whose dusty remains we see, tell me, spirits, and may the dark banks of the sticks which forbid all return binding you with a th with a three times triple turn not confine your shadowy forms tell me then for one of you may still be hidden here below do you not feel your pain increase when you see on these dusty roman hills the work of your hands reduced to nothing but a dusty plain Quite a challenge there. Uh, he's here trying to uh, hold a little seance. He's trying to speak with the dead, trying to uh, bridge that gap between mortality and immortality. Um, there are uh, pale spirits and ashen shades who are just invisible, but behind or within the visible world. A uh, great sense of interiority of inanimate objects, great sense of the, uh, the, 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 the wonder of a, a hidden uh, uh, evidence of divinity within that world, um, the great sense of loss, great sense of human loss for this, uh, for, uh, for not having the, uh, the wonder of Rome still in its grandest splendor. Um, that, that, that passion, again, that comes out, tell me, spirits, tell me, I need to know that great passion that comes forth is, is, is stirring, but probably the most revolutionary, the most significant aspect of this comes out in, in the, the, the nature of the question itself. When you see on these Roman hills, the work of your dusty hands reduced to nothing of your hands reduced to nothing but a dusty plain. Do you not feel your pain increase? Um, now, these are Romans. Uh, these are probably pagans. Uh, so, um, you know, they are in an afterlife in a Christian world. They, uh, ref reflecting from the perspective of, of a Christian world, uh, these Romans are, are probably in purgatory or perhaps even hell. Um, if they are in hell, uh, supposedly their pain and suffering is quite acute. Uh, different theologians will have different ideas about this. Uh, but the, uh, the idea that uh, th they would be bothered by anything on earth is, I think, quite revolutionary. Tell me then, for one of you may still be hidden here below. You're still here. You're still lingering here. You're still concerned with earth. Earth is the focus. Earth is the center. Earth is reality. And it's somehow more important. If, well, it's somehow more attractive, perhaps it's more important than the heavenly sphere. Afterlife in any sense, whether it is heaven or hell or purgatory or wherever the afterlife put the, uh, the great Roman spirits. Um, it is somehow 
uh, still a lesser light than earthly reality. Earthly reality is paramount. Earthly reality, human life, the work of humans is somehow in this more important than the afterlife.